the one thing that I noticed that's different about your content from everyone else's is that you actually like to highlight the beauty of struggle. Why do you feel it's so important? And, and what beauty do you see in struggle, first of all? And why do you feel it's so important for everyone to be very aware of that? Yeah, you know what? Having worked in productivity for you know, over 10 years, one of the things I noticed was that's exactly what people want. It's like, tell me how to do it quicker, faster, more efficiently. And yes, all those things exist and they help. But what I noticed was happening was people were coming back to me to say, yeah, Grace, things are great. Like I've got my inbox under control. You know, I'm, I've got my to-do list sorted, but there are times when I'm still struggling. Help, what's wrong with me? And the more I had those conversations, the more I realized, hang on, there's nothing wrong with you. And actually there's nothing, you know, just because you're struggling doesn't mean that there's something wrong in the first place. And in fact, when we think that there's something wrong, we're more likely to either avoid it or we back up and go, we've gone the wrong way. Um, or we think it's a battle that we just need to fight the way through. And what I notice is that doesn't always help us to be able to face a struggle, to be able to deal with like what's actually going on here. So if every time we struggle, we think that something's gone horribly wrong, or maybe something's wrong with us, we're going to try and get away from it and try and avoid it. And yet often, what I noticed when you know, I was having these conversations with my clients, with my coaching clients, and with sort of delegates and in workshops was, hang on a minute, tell me more about this thing that you're struggling with. And the more they talked to me about it, the more I thought, nah, th this thing called struggle isn't just an obstacle that we need to overcome or a sign that we're in the wrong place. You know, sometimes it's a sign that we're in absolutely the right place because you know, when we associate productivity with efficiency, that can help us to get the familiar things done faster, but it doesn't always help us to navigate the new um, and the innovative because a lot of that can feel a lot like struggle because you're doing something new, you're pioneering new territory. And so if we avoid struggle or if we make struggle this taboo that we're trying to, trying to get rid of or trying to avoid, we sometimes miss the opportunities to learn, to grow, to innovate. We might miss the opportunities to connect and form a deeper relationship with the people that we're working with. And we also miss the opportunities to grow and to strengthen. And sometimes, you know, actually some of our best learnings, our best discoveries, our best work can come right away from struggle. And so that's why I started diving into this thing called struggle, this thing that we don't want to talk about and going, what if we can take that to do away? What if we can kind of lift the veil and, and go, what's actually going on here? That's beautiful. Let me ask you this one question that I get asked a lot and I have yet to find I think the answer that I think would bring reassurance to people, I don't think I have it yet. So I often get asked, what does it mean when you keep failing over and over and over again? You keep trying, but you keep failing. And I always get very spiritual, very religious <laughs> with people. That doesn't always work <laughs> because the other person has to be very receptive to that. So I want to ask you that. When that's what your struggle looks like, then how do you how do you perceive it? What, what sort of mindset do you maintain in in when the failure just keeps coming back. Yeah. You know what? I, if somebody said that to me, I think my first response would be, tell me more. Um, and the reason why I say that is, tell me more, invite somebody to get curious about what's going on, to kind of describe it in detail, to go, well, what's, what's really going on here? And sometimes what happens when we hit failure or struggle is we want to just jump straight to the answer. And we can't always find that without getting curious. So I'd be curious about what do you mean when, you know, what do you mean by I keep failing? Is it exactly the same thing that you keep failing at? Or actually, is it more the case that you keep pushing yourself? You know, so every time you get a bit better at it, but then you hit a new thing that you fail at and you get a bit better at it, then you hit something else. Um, because you know, when we think of, oh, I keep failing, we, we can take that as I'm not moving, I'm not progressing. But if actually what's happening is every time we get somewhere, our bar is going higher and then we meet and then our bar goes higher, we're actually growing and we're not failing. And so you know, failure, if we see failure as just this kind of, uh, I suppose it's one of the differences between fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. The fixed mindset is, you know, I can or I can't. And failure is this kind of immovable object. Whereas growth mindset is like, okay, failure means I've just, I've hit the limit of what I know. And I've started getting into that new territory of what I don't know. So, you know, is it a closed door or an open door? Um, you know, so, so if it's if it's an invitation to learn more, 
then that's a very different thing to a judgment that tells me I'm not good enough. Let me expand on my question because a lot of the times I think what most prominently the theme of those questions is either around love or it's around finances. It's either on money or love. And the money question is always that I keep trying to make money. Money keeps evading me. Even when I get a promotion, something happens, the money goes away. Uh, I was in an accident, lost all my money uh, to medical uh, bills and stuff. The same for love, did everything, changed myself, worked on my, so stuff like that. And I always think that there is no right answer because again, I am spiritual. Sometimes I think the world is inviting you to go on this journey that's at the end of which you're going to be like a completely different person and then you kind of have to go through to get through and then I think it all comes down to mindset in a case like that it all comes down to a mindset do you think there is something there like something to hold on to something to keep repeating to yourself some exercise to do something there for you to hold on to that will help you get through that period when nothing seems to be making sense yeah, I, I I see your point there. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of those frustrations come from surely if I do the right things, then I'll get the right results. And sometimes you know, sometimes reality is I do the right things and I didn't get the results that I wanted. You know, some of it can just be it was the wrong it was the wrong thing. It was the wrong time. It was the wrong person. Um, there's, I think, especially when it comes to love, but also when it comes to money, there, there's always a, an element of luck or serendipity or, or fate or whatever you want to call it. There's, there's always an element that's outside of our control. And I think it's useful to know that. It's useful to know not everything is within my, my control. I can do all the right things, but still, you know, things don't, I don't get the results that I expected. So I think that's always useful to, to, to remember. But then also to kind of think, what is within my control? And what, what is this telling me? What am I learning from it? What, I, what do I not want to see here? Because again, I think it, you, know, you, you mentioned mindset. Your mindset very much comes from like our beliefs, you know, these deep-seated beliefs around love, around money. A lot of those are really deep. And a lot of those are things that we don't naturally want to look at. So it takes some time to unearth it. So if something, I always find like if I have a, an experience that really kind of triggers some very deep, uh, big emotions, it's an unpleasant experience, but it's always telling me something. So what are those emotions trying to tell me? What am I, you know, what can I learn from that? Where do they come from? What are the, the stories I'm telling um, that, that sort of support that? Um, and then once you, we know that, you can then decide, is that story serving me? Is that belief serving me? If not, what can I change it for? What else could it be? Because um, I think also sometimes what can happen you know, with those situations is we keep going around in circles. So there's a saying that says, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> um, so if you're used to being able to like you know, escape from a situation and go find something else and you're going to go, hang on, it's happened to me again. It could be actually, it's not, the problem isn't out there. Like the problem can be, you know, what's going on in here and what's going on in here and you know giving ourselves that space to really just be honest and go you know, what is going on here how did this thing come to pass what was within my control how did I contribute to it and what do I want to learn from that what do I want to do differently next time what do I want to let go of that's not serving me anymore and also, where are the gaps? Like, what do I need to learn? Because we, yeah, we grow up with the skills that we grow up with, the, the mindsets that we grow up with are very much dictated by our environment, the people we have around us, the situations, the context. So, you know, quite often it's like, well, that's the only thing I knew. And, you know, when we're aware that it's not serving us anymore, I think that's when we can then decide, okay, even if I don't know what the alternative is, if I know I don't want this anymore, I can start looking for what's another way of thinking about this. Who else can I learn from? Um, and you know, and, and if I start looking at other people who act differently in those situations, how can I learn from them? I remember once um, a long time ago, a, a mentor, a business mentor, said to me, "Look into people that you admire. Don't look up to them. 
Because when you look up to people, you put them on a pedestal. And you're like, oh, I can't be as good as them. They're so amazing. True. But if you look into them, you can then study them. Like, what do they say? How do they say it? How do they show up? What do they do? Who do they learn from? How do they spend their time? And all those things can form their mindset and their behaviors. I have to know, in your journey, did you ever have to, like, consciously uncover your beliefs that you thought were keeping you stuck and if yes then what was that process like oh gosh yes and so many times <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you know what I went through very early on in, in in my business journey I went through very much a, a lot of a lot of what I felt like were false starts so you know I would follow somebody learn from them buy their courses, implement. Um, I remember actually that very clearly there was this one particular course that I'd paid, I think it was a thousand pounds for. And back then that was a lot of money for someone just starting out. And I followed the whole program to the letter. I was the perfect student. I was the person who was implementing every single time and it didn't get me any results. And when I had the debrief call with the person, I said, I've done it all. I haven't got the results. And it was really interesting because what they said to me was, yeah, well, it could be this and it could be that. Um, but tell you what, I'm, I've got this program, which is £3,000. <laughs> where I'll help you with that. <laughs> and I was like, but hang on a minute, this is what you promised me. It was, it was you know, the, the, the headline was something like, you know, £50,000 in whatever, you know, in 50 days or, or something I can't remember what what the promise was but like here was the promise and you haven't delivered on that promise I don't trust you enough to go for the next thing and now I didn't realize it at the time but if I trace it back I was a straight A student at school so I had this history of what do people want from me what am I supposed to do um how do I get things right and then I'd be told what to do by teachers. I'd do it. I'd get the A grade. And yeah, that would be a tick in the box. That's what success looked like. Now, building a business is completely different because, yes, there are skills that you can learn and you can learn from people. But it, often it's about figuring out what is it that I've got and how do I work? And I'm not the same as the person who's teaching me. So, yes, I can learn from them, but I can copy everything they do and I won't get the same results. And so, through that and through a whole load of other experiences as well, I think one of the things I've learned in building my business is, yes, you can absolutely learn from other people, but you also need to then filter it through your own experience in terms of what's working, what's not. Um, what do I enjoy doing? How can I do more of that? And so, you know, I, I talk a lot about sort of defining success on your own terms. That's not just about like, oh, do I want this car or that house or that beach holiday? It's more around, you know, what are the things that bring me to life? You know, what do I love doing so much that I lose track of time? How do I do more of that? What are some ways that I can help people that really bring value that actually come really easily to me? You know, and then those are, those are some of the ways that we find our sweet spot. But you can only kind of do that, you can only do that with some experience. You've got to try stuff and then go, oh, that was the wrong way. Okay, that tells me something. Um, try something like, oh, that felt good. I'll do more of that. You know, and then you go a certain way. It's like, oh, no, that's too far. I think I need to adapt, adapt again. It's really hard to know that theoretically. You kind of have to try stuff. And so that's why, that's another reason why I see failure as, as really useful information. Like, yes, if you keep making the same mistakes again, exactly the same mistakes again, it'd be like, what am I not learning from this? Um, but, you know, if you have a new thing that's it's like, okay, what is this telling me now? And that's how we can learn it. Often, you know, I, I wrote in, in Struggle, actually, that when I was trying to build my business and trying to figure out who's my ideal market, who's my ideal audience, actually, the times when I had the wrong client, they taught me so much more. Because when things go well, you're like, great. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing. But when things don't go well, it's like, whoa, what just happened there? And they're, they're so rich in information. So again, that's why I call it like an open door rather than a closed door. I love that. I love that so much because I think not enough people talk about it. We expect change and positive change, change that moves you upward, forward 
to always come in the form of a breakthrough, a sudden breakthrough, like the light pouring in. But it's it's actually never like that. It's never like that. You have to live through some really shitty times, some really slow, boring times. You have to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And then things will start to happen. And sometimes you have to just keep asking the same question of yourself over and over and over again to get the right answer. And it's so tedious, but that's, it has to be done. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no other way. And I hate that there's an, uh, an entire industry that's built on telling a different lie, like telling a lie that tells a different version of the story, a version that's not true at all. But that's how people sell their content. That's one of the reasons why I feel like, no, courses, courses don't work. Coaching does, but courses, because your struggles are so unique to you. You, there's no shortcut here. And if for some reason the shortcut has worked, I'm more scared for you then. <laughs> yeah, if it, if it does work, it's like, why did it work? Um, and, and again, I remember um, speaking with a friend of mine. We both went on, you know, we were both part of the same mastermind group. So we both worked with the same person in the same mastermind group. And she kind of just you know, flew. You know, she, she was implementing stuff. It was working really well for her. And, and I and another person, we were doing exactly the same things, but it just wasn't working. And it wasn't until some years later we were chatting about that. We were like, what's going on there? And she said, I was lucky in that you know, me and that person running that program, we were very similar. And so what worked for her naturally worked for me. You know, there, are, there are areas where we're not similar, but in terms of our personalities, in terms of how we work, we were very similar. So I was able to, to copy a lot of stuff from her you know, and, and it worked for me, whereas it didn't work for you. Yeah, the, the principle, the underlying principle is probably the same, but how you implement it needs to be translated for yourself. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of, and, and it's funny actually, because I think a lot of the sort of gurus will say, don't, don't work with too many people, don't sign up to too many yeah, things because you'll have conflicting advice and then you won't know whose advice to implement. And I get that. I do, I do get that. I think we can very easily go for information overload. But at the same time, what I've noticed is of all the people I've worked with, and I have invested to work with lots of people, you know, because I don't I don't know everything, so I'm I'm very keen to learn from other people. But of all the people I've invested in, not a single person has been the answer. You know, I've learned different things from different people um, and 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 synthesized it. And some of it has served me for a season and then not served me anymore. Some of it has been like ongoing. But it is, it's kind of like building your own jigsaw puzzle and, and figuring out what, what fits with you. Yeah, that's so true. That's one of the reasons why, you know, books have to be like everybody's best friends. If you're not friends with books, dude, you're missing out on so much. <laughs> and oh man, I mean, if you had a budget of thousand pounds for a course, how many books can you buy with that? Can you buy? Oh yeah. my God, yes. <laughs> so true. Um, I have to like slip a warning in there for anybody listening because I have seen this happen so many times. Like people keep failing and it's always life's fault or the universe's fault or someone else's fault. In which case, you know, what you have talked about so beautifully up to this point, you're missing out on that entire process, which is, yes, uncomfortable, which is, yes, very difficult. And yes, oftentimes very boring, but it is necessary work that has to be done. And if you are constantly failing and constantly every single time it's someone else's fault, you're you're feeding yourself a fantasy. That's not true. <laughs> it's you, pal. It's always you, unless you're a kid. In which case, you're probably not listening to this podcast. Mm. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a really good point because uh, you know, some yeah, for some people, it's they've actually come from a background where maybe as a kid they had no control, and and so some of those things that you might have learnt as a habitual thing, it could be that actually in earlier life it served you, it protected you, it saved you, and so those are the the habits that you keep using. Um, and maybe in later life, it's just no longer serving you anymore. It's like, no, actually, I don't. I can stand down those defenses. And that's one of the things I talk about in struggle is how you know, it's really natural to to resist struggle. It's really natural to go, I don't want this. Yeah, this is not where I wanted to be. And it's it's really natural for our instinctive response to struggle to be one of of fear. Basically, it's like danger. Get away from this. Um, and, and when we recognize that, we can recognize that the instinctive responses to fear 
are designed to save us and protect us from danger. But at the same time, if what's on the other side of that struggle is the thing that you want, then maybe we don't need to be saved from it. Yeah, so maybe those danger responses, those fear responses, they're misguided. They're in the wrong place. So to give like a, a very common example, it might be if, if you grew up knowing that speaking your truth, speaking your mind is not a safe thing to do. If you grow up knowing that if you spoke the truth, you would get punished for it, then you would learn to not speak your truth. You would learn to, to figure out what they want to hear from you and, and tell them that instead, because that's your survival mechanism. Now, fast forward into adulthood when it's, you know, you're not a child anymore. You have a bit more control, but actually that behavior might just be learned. It might just be the thing that you're used to doing. It's, you're so used to doing it, you don't even know you're doing it. You know, and, and I think that comes to your point of like, what am I missing here? What's the thing that I'm not noticing about myself? And then once we notice that thing, we can then go, hang on, me telling them what they want to hear rather than speaking my truth. Is that actually serving me here? Is that actually saving me? What is it saving me from? <laughs> you know, and, 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 um, you know, if that instinct isn't serving me anymore, then I can, I can stand it down. I can, I can say, thank you. You protected me before but I don't need you right now. I don't need you anymore. It's okay. We're, we're good here. We don't need to you know, save ourselves from this lion, as it were. Yeah. My next question was, I think you kind of answered it, was going to be, how do you sit in the discomfort? How do you sit in the discomfort of not having the answers, of not knowing whether the answer you are eventually going to find is even going to be the right one or not? So again, useful to know, our instinct is run away or you know, run away or fight because it's like, if, it, if there's a genuinely life-threatening situation, we need to act fast in order to find our way to safety. So that's why you know, it's kind of like you know, we, want, we want that fast and, and that kind of immediate answer. So you're, even the words that you use, how do you sit with it? You don't sit if there is imminent danger, do you? Like, you know, if a bear is chasing down the street at you, you don't sit. You either find a tree to climb or get something to defend yourself with. And so even the act of sitting kind of defies danger. You know, it's a way of telling you your body, yeah, this is not a danger situation. I do not need to run or fight. You know, this is a situation where I can sit and I can notice. And so whether that is literally sitting or going for a walk or deliberately slowing yourself down. So one really practical thing I've noticed is when I'm in that sort of fight and flight mode, everything goes faster in my body. Like my heart is pumping, I'm breathing faster, I'm talking faster, I'm louder, you know, I'm more animated. And so if I notice that and I want to be able to sit with something, even just slowing down my words, taking a slower breath, yeah, those things can very quickly just speak calm to your body um, in, in just very grounded, very practical way. Um, equally, things like taking yourself outside, being in nature, you know, a lot of the, I mean, the hippies had a lot of things right, <laughs> I, I think. You know, a lot of those kind of things of like being grounded in nature because biologically, they also communicate safety to us. Another one I've noticed recently is I've had a couple of um, things recently where I've been on like a, um, a retreat in nature. So been around a campfire and I've noticed that actually even just a campfire, like you, you look into a campfire and there is that calming sense, isn't there? You kind of, you calm, you, you, it's, it's mesmerizing, you can watch the flames. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, I was like, is there a, because um, my friend is um, a primal health coach, so he does a lot around natural movement and, and primal lifestyle and, and healthy eating and that sort of thing. I said, is there something primal about a campfire? And he said, yeah, yeah, there is. Because, you know, and, and he went into lots of science, you know, right the way from like the red and the glow and what that does for our eyes and all that kind of stuff. But he also said, if you think about you know, the, the days when we lived in tribes, well, you wouldn't light a campfire if you were hunting or if you were running from danger. You have the campfire when you're in safety. Yeah, it's when you're ready to 
you know, to cook the dinner. You're ready to eat together and to tell your stories around the campfire. So I think those kind of things are, are very much, um, you know, almost genetically programmed you know, through generations of kind of going, what are the things that help us to return to safety? So talking things through with people, you know, it sounds really simple, but talking things through with someone you trust, again, it's something we used to do when we would come back to the tribe and we tell our stories around the campfire. So storytelling, talking with each other, eating together, um, you know, all of those things are ways of signaling uh, to our bodies, oh, we're in rest and digest mode now. We're in that kind of regroup, reflect, review, rather than quick, I've got to do something and get, you know, get myself safe. I have to ask, because I'm always curious about this. Right now in this world, there are several different generations living together. Like we can watch all of them and how they live their lives and the, like the narrow it down to processes and whatnot. And everybody's confused by everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think are people getting right today about life, about all the question marks that life brings, all the chaos, all the struggle? And what are they getting terribly wrong, if anything? That's such a good question. I don't know if I have a straight answer to that. It's funny. I remember going to um, an event once where somebody was talking about, I think they were talking about sort of millennial generation. This go back some time now. Um, and, and it's funny because they pulled out all these quotes about the youth of today. And it turned out all of those quotes came from different timelines, right back to like Roman times. <laughs> so it's, it's like, that there's always been this dialogue of like, oh, the youth of today don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm always a bit aware of stereotyping and typecasting when it comes to generations. However, some of the things I have noticed, I think, let's take the, that kind of conversation resilience. I think a lot of what we have now are, you know, in terms of our older generation, for them, resilience was, if you think of sort of the post-war generations, you know, resilience was very much a case of you, you, you make do. You, know, you deal with whatever you have and you, you, you do your best with that. It's, it's, you know, that's where the hard work ethic comes in. That's where the, you don't let anything stop you. You, know, you. you get bombed and you have nowhere to live. You get up and you go and find some food and, and find somewhere. And, um, so that, that was what resilience looked like. And... You know, and, and I think there are some, yes, you know, there are some narratives around that. For that generation, resilience was very practical, and it wasn't so much emotional. So maybe I wonder if the the downside of that was that generation didn't really know how to talk about their feelings. Yes, you know, so true. <laughs> yeah, and and it's funny because that generation might look at some of the younger generations now, go, oh, you know, why why is there a mental health crisis? Right. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> like they have so much more abundantly, abundant resources and opportunities compared to what we had. Why are they depressed? Why are they anxious? And they don't understand. And you know, and, and it's you know, it, it's because it, it's kind of it's context. You know, actually having lots of choice doesn't necessarily mean that life is easy. Sometimes it makes life really hard. Um, you know, and sometimes it kind of puts that you know, if, if you're in survival mode and there is only one path you can find, however hard, at least that's the only path. You go, right, that's the one I've got to do. You know, if you're being told all the time, you can do anything, you can be anything, but you just got to make sure you choose the right one. And there's all this choice. It's like, how do I choose? You know, even just choosing the right path becomes like, that's, you know, that's the test I've got to pass. And you know, but there can be a lot of yeah, that can be debilitating, having too much choice. I remember hearing a story of somebody, I think it was someone who lived in, I forget the country, so I'm not going to say the country in case I get it wrong, but one of the Eastern Bloc countries, so part of the Soviet Bloc. Um, and then when kind of communism fell, um, they, the, this was a story of them going into, I think it was a stationery shop. And they were like, I just want a pen. And there were all these pens. They're like, <laughs> what insanity is this? I just need a pen. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> and it reminds me of, I remember when we took, my sister is two years younger than me, and uh, when she went to university, we, we I, me and my husband, we, we helped her move in. Um, 
And um, we, yeah, so yeah, we helped her move in and we took her to the supermarket. I remember her standing in front of this whole wall of bread and just be like, <laughs> Jews. <laughs> well, you know, so, so I think, you know, what I would say is each generation we have our challenges. Um, and, you know, the, the younger generation actually, you know what, some, some of the mental health crisis could be because we have too much choice or it could be because we put this, you know, this thing on like you have to find the best of everything. We have to like optimize everything, make the most of every day. And that in itself, I mean, it, yes, it can be motivating, but it can also be taken too far. Um, yes. I think with most things, actually, you can take things too far and it can become, you know, there's a shadow side to things. Yeah, overcorrection is definitely like the problem. We don't know where to stop. Um, yeah, we don't know where to stop. And I think we also like want to get it perfectly right. I think I remember um, reading a romance book that was recommended by a friend to me and and I read it and I remember telling her that the guy never didn't actually love her. Like it took him nine years of marriage to realize that he loved her, which means he clearly didn't love her. And my friend's like very calmly, uh, she's like, no, but love is not perfect. Sometimes it takes, you know, nine years to figure out that you actually love this person. And sometimes you have to lose. Like she gave me like a whole explanation. And she's like, people do themselves such a disservice in love, particularly because they want the perfect love. And that simply does not happen. Love can never be perfect. And that is why so many people are alone. And I'm like, she's right. <laughs> she's so right. I never even realized it. And there's there's a beauty to understanding that. I think that's one of the problems that I see in people who are younger than me. And then, of course, like you said, like the older ones, they're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I'm like, calm down. Just take a minute here and listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely it's like you know I was talking to my daughter she's 15 and um and we were chatting about sort of generations and, and I'm like I feel like her generation have got a better idea of of like boundaries you know in in relationships in friendships as well as um you know in um in romantic relationships I remember saying something to her saying oh, that was it yeah we were leaving them in charge so my daughter's 15 my son's 19 we recently had the first time where we left them at home and we went away for a few days and, and sort of they, they were in charge. And I you know, did the whole thing right. Okay, so here are the rules, like no parties, no this, no like. And, and she's like, why do you think I'd have a party? Um, <laughs> so, anyway. um, I was like, no, but I'm just telling you in case you have a friend who says, you know, Oh, yeah, you've got a house to yourself, so we can have a party. And, you know, and if they say to you, well, did your parents tell you you can't? And if I didn't actually say that you can't, you might be going, oh, no, they didn't. And she's like, yeah, that, that would be a toxic friend. I don't think, you know, I, my friends are not like that. I'm like, yeah, in my day, I would have just called it peer pressure, <laughs> you <Yes>. know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, in some ways, I think our generation are, are ahead of where we were. I grew up in the 90s, and when I look back at 90, 90s romance films, it's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, no wonder we've had so many re yeah, relationship issues. That's so many problems with this. <laughs> so true, so true. They really, like, I grew up on Bollywood, and I also grew up on Jane Austen and Bond with Vin, Margaret Mitchell, and I'm like, this messed up everything. Nothing is good enough anymore. <laughs> and then again, it comes back to options. Oh, plenty of fish in the sea. I'll find someone better. It's like, and then and so many of us just get tired. We're like, it's it's fine. I'm I'm good. I'm okay being by myself. It's all good. <laughs> that is so true. It makes me uneasy how smart this generation is. Like they know stuff that I think I figured out at 21 and they're, 12 year olds are asking questions that I asked when I was 21 and went away for uni to another country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yet they still need, I think they still need that experiential learning. I think you know, they've got so much access to knowledge and information. They can find out so much just by, by thinking and looking it up and, and kind of absorbing it all into their heads. But I think that there's, there's stuff that you learn that you can't learn without actually doing stuff and doing something. Um, and I think, you know, the, the sort of the years that the, especially the, the generation that's grown up through COVID, I still don't think we fully understand what they've lost 
you're in those years of, of like social scaffolding and the experiential opportunities is like how do you even just um I, this is a really silly example but I remember when we were living in Hong Kong I was in um early secondary school so I was probably like 10 11 that sort of thing and I remember one um one time somebody convinced me to like you know get off the bus early and go a different route and and it all felt like oh this is you know exciting and, and a, you know, a bit sort of not following the rules and stuff like that and there was this like fence we had to climb over and we, you know, we both climbed over the, this fence because we lived on this estate that had like you know there was like a, a leisure complex so you had a you know, pool and badminton courts and things like that and so the gate would take you through to the pool and then we'd have to go through the the changing rooms to get to the other side um, and my friend who was a boy went through the boys changing rooms I went through the girls changing room the female changing rooms were closed because they had a sauna in there. Someone was in the sauna, so they'd locked the back door so I couldn't get through. So I had to climb all the way back out and go the long way around. And so I was really late to get home. And when I was climbing over, the thing that we used to climb over sort of basically knocked over my foot and then bruising my foot and it was really swollen. And I had this like moment of having to tell my mum because yeah, she was like, why are you so late? And I made up a story. And then I was like, my foot's really swollen. I think I need to show my mum. <laughs> like those, yeah, that you can't read about in a book. You know, that, that, those kind of kind of moments of learning. Like, do I speak up? Do I own up? You know, do I follow the rule breaker? Yeah, you know, all of those are are experiential learnings, and and you have to kind of be there. You have to do stuff. You have to be willing to get things wrong. You know, and and that. You know, that I mean, that's a childhood story, but I think it's it's often a lesson we still have to learn as adults is, you know, are are we willing to play and find out? Are we willing to get things wrong and you know, and, and sort of find out like, like a, what are my values and what are my boundaries? And, and when I cross them, it's like, oh, that's how bad I feel. OK, that's you know, that, that tells me something about what matters to me. Tell me, how do we, like, we talked a lot about supporting ourselves through a period of struggle, but how do we support other people going through a period of struggle? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. And so I am naturally a helper. I like helping other people. I get a lot of, you know, I, I get a lot of value from helping people. I, you know, enjoy it. Um, and so sometimes what can happen is I can jump into fixing mode. You know, if someone's going through a struggle, it's like, especially if it's something I know something about, I can then go, oh, let me give you this idea or this resource or this whatever. Um, and sometimes that can be helpful. Other times it's just really irritating. Um, I don't know if you've ever had that, like, where you're like, you're just trying to talk to a friend about something and they're like, I know what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that I've learned and that I wrote about in Struggle is, is the difference between being a fixer and a witness. You know, sometimes we don't need a fixer. Sometimes we just need a witness. We need someone to see in us um, you know, our strength rather than a fixer will go, here, take my strength. You know, you can, you know, I can help you out of this manhole. Whereas a witness goes, I see you're in a manhole. I see you are strong. Look, I can see, you know, they, might, they might point things out. They might say, I can see there's something there you could hold on to. Now, if you put your hand there and put your foot there, I believe in you. You can, you know, you can get out of there. Um, and there are times for both. You know, sometimes you know, it is helpful to get into that manhole with somebody and help them out. Other times, actually, the more helpful thing might be you know, to, to be able to see them and go alongside them rather than to rescue them or fix things for them. So I think when it comes to supporting other people through struggle, you know, encouraging them to go through that same process of self-awareness. So just as if it was yourself, you would sit with it. With them, sit with them. You know, don't rush in to try and drag their way through the tunnel. Sit with them. Be in that space with them. Um, and let them, you know, almost kind of, you know, that helps them to know that they don't have to run away from a bear. You know, it helps them to know that this is a safe place to sit. And then you can look at stuff together you can kind of almost go, okay, let's see what we can see here. So that's where you know, we can invite that sense of curiosity rather than the sense of fear. So fear and curiosity are almost like opposites. Fear will say danger, don't go there. 
curiosity will go, oh, that's interesting. Let's take a closer look. Um, and so, you, you know, by creating that space, by sitting with someone, you can create the space for them to be curious in that space and to see what they see and notice what they notice. And then you're also saying to them, what, you know, what do you want to do about this? You know, and so when they're ready to start moving forward, you're saying, I'm with you. I'm here for you. you know, what do you need? And what do you need is a really good question to ask as well, especially you know, in those conversations. So if you do have a friend come to you go, I've got a problem, and they start telling you about the problem, you know, whenever it's appropriate, you know, ask the question, like, what do you need here? Do you need, you know, do you need, do you need me just to like agree with you and go, yeah, you're absolutely right. That person was terrible. And you know, you know, do you need me just to like, you know, agree and empathize with you in that way? Do you need me just to listen? Do you, are you looking for ideas and answers or advice? Or are you wanting to, you know, just verbalize and talk things through? What do you need from me right now? Um, and you know, they might not know, but they might have an idea. And at least that kind of shows it's like you're, you're asking, you're even just asking the question rather than just offering answers. And between you, you can probably figure out something that's more useful than just diving in. That's beautiful. I want to ask you about, because there's a lot of, there's a very strong element of emotionalism in what everything we've talked about. The emotions are going to be running high through it all. So if you are in that place of overwhelm, how do you make your way back to sanity so you can start making decisions that will actually help you? Yeah, so I think it's standing down that sort of state of arousal, you know, the, the kind of when emotions are high. So noticing and naming helps um, because when our emotions are high, it's, it's very much our limbic brain that's kind of activating and that, that's the sort of fight and flight center. When we notice and name things, when we label things, that is more of a, um, I want to say prefrontal cortex. I might be wrong. I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, but you know, it's, it's the, basically the higher functions of our brain that is involved in naming things. So even the act of naming emotions um, or naming facts, so sometimes a, a technique I'll use is what are the facts, what are the fears, and what are the feelings? So that's one way you can use to kind of sit with something and break it down to like, like what actually happened? What are the facts? And what are my feelings around that? And name those feelings. And what's the fear that sits behind it? And that act of naming is a really good way of getting that logical brain back online, you know, the part of the brain that can you know, start to kind of discern and, and to make, you know, make good judgment decisions. So that's a good way of kind of doing that. Um, the whole sort of sensory regulation thing that we touched on earlier, um, slowing down, breathing, um, you know, grounding, all of that kind of stuff is, is super helpful to kind of try and get ourselves back into that state as well. And I think giving yourself a bit of grace as well. So if you are in a, if you're really upset or angry or overwhelmed and you just tell yourself, come on, calm down. Or if someone, if someone tells you to calm down, it's like the, the most useless thing in the world because it, you, know, you just like you rebel against it. It gets yeah, it's just not useful. So like flipping that switch isn't always helpful. So sometimes just honouring the feeling. Um, so there's my friend Josie actually. She she talks about feeling the feelings without feeding them. So feel the feelings without feeding them. Um, and you know, and it, it's like rather than suppress your feelings. What is a good way of honoring, acknowledging them without feeding them and kind of making them bigger? So it's like you're not, you're not making them go away. You're not feeding them and fueling it. You're finding that middle ground where you're just honoring it and going, yeah, I am you know, annoyed. I am frustrated. I do feel let down or, or whatever it is. And, and because this, this and this. So you're increasing that awareness whilst not sort of making it bigger or small so you're not minimizing it and you're not blowing it up but you are defining it and getting it really sort of concrete and then you can go right now I've got this thing what am I going to do with it hey, that's beautiful I love all of your answers you're like a spiritual guru as well, <laughs> well they are just opinions as well <laughs> but I love them I uh, I think this is 
because everything is all about the practical and all about the tips and the steps and the how tos. I think we forget that there is wisdom is what actually drives us forward in a way where we are achieving things, but we're doing it in a way that's respectful to our soul. I think that is something that we we often lose sight of. But I think also when you're when you when you know the why to behind the how to that can then help you to adapt it to make it your own. So really interestingly, actually, I was chatting to uh, my husband and he he told me of a conversation that he had with a fellow runner. So that they, they, well, I run and my husband runs, but he runs a lot faster and further than me. Um, but yeah, he goes on these trail runs. And on one of these trail runs, they had somebody as part of the group volunteer to do like a breathing exercise. And there was a member of the group who was like, oh, I can't do these. And it turns out that this person has ADHD and they find the idea of being still and focusing on your breath actually anxiety inducing. It's like, no, I can't, you know, that, that doesn't work for me. It, it actually increases my anxiety. It doesn't calm me down. So if all you know is the how to, um, you know, breathing, you, you know, that person will go, doesn't work. But if you know the why to, the why to is about, you know, restoring that sort of parasympathetic system the nervous system rather than sympathetic so going back to the rest and digest system rather than the fight and flight system that's the why to so the breathing is one way of getting into that if you know why you can find another way of getting into it for so for this person they actually find the running itself really meditative yeah for you know, for, for that person i suspect meditation for them isn't sitting still it is probably doing something that's quite repetitive. Um, it's finding that stillness in motion. So, you know, and, and that's why the why to matter. So, you know, how tos are great, but once you understand why, you can, you, you know, you can understand it better and go, oh, that's why it works. And then if you're in a situation where that's not working anymore, you can find another alternative. But also, if you happen to find that actually that particular how to doesn't do the thing it's supposed to, if you know what it's supposed to do, then you can find something else. Yeah. It was in a business seminar where someone advised that you have to keep moving. You have to keep moving. If one strategy doesn't work, move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. And I understand why they gave that advice. It it makes sense. In some context, I guess it makes sense. But I can't help but think that maybe if you stop and deliberate and reflect, you may still have to try 10 things. But maybe if you don't, you may have to try 100 things. Maybe, just maybe. I think what what they're really saying is like don't get stuck. Yeah, you know, don't get stuck. Or you know, find you, know, you find progress in motion basically. But you have to keep moving can also be interpreted as you're not allowed to stop. You know, and maybe what they're saying is don't just stop and give up entirely. But you know, that isn't the only way of stopping. You can also stop for a breath. <laughs> you, know, you can also stop and pause and reflect. And actually, that can help you decide where to go next rather than just run round, one round in circles. Because um, one of the things I talk about with them um, when I start talking about fight and flight, I also talk about the other two fear responses, which is freeze and fawn. Um, and freeze is, is a really interesting one in modern day life because freeze can look like decision paralysis, but it can also look like busyness, which almost feels like the opposite. But if you think about it, in the wild, an animal will freeze and play dead and hope that the predator will pass it by. In the modern workplace, if you're really still, that's going to get you noticed. So what's the best way to assimilate? To be really busy. And so freeze can look like, I'm so busy dealing with all of this stuff that I know how to do. I've got time to deal with that thing that feels like a struggle. And again, once you understand why, you can then go, ah, okay, that's what's going on. So in that case, the advice to that person isn't you've got to keep moving because they keep moving, but they're actually just going around in circles. Yeah, the advice is like, you're not running from a bear. Stop, take stock, decide where you want to go, and then go in that direction rather than just keep going around in circles. Yeah, there is there's such truth in what you just said. I mean, how much of what we are doing, this whole thing with constantly moving, is because everyone else is constantly moving? Right. I think that's something else that you've often pointed out in your content. It's, uh, you know, there's so many misconceptions around what is 
productive, what is not productive, what is su- success, what makes you successful, what doesn't. How many times are you making choices simply because other people are making those same choices? Except we don't really know anyone else's story. So you might be doing yourself a great disservice by not stopping simply because you are insecure. And that insecurity is because someone else, to your understanding, is getting it right. And therefore, you must do what they're doing. And yeah, so true. (laughs) How do we, I think one of the reasons why we can't stop and deliberate and reflect, why we can't allow ourselves that luxury or I don't know if it's a luxury or not, but it seems like certainly seems like that right now. <laughs> but the, one of the reasons why we can't do that is because it starts to affect. I think it has something to do with self perception, self image. It has something to do with it changes how you view yourself. And I think I don't know if I'm framing this right or not, but I feel like that should change. In fact, that's a great opportunity for you to see yourself differently in the wake of a failure, especially. But uh, Talk to me about that. Talk to me about how do we go through all the processes that you've so beautifully helped us understand but without it negatively impacting our self-image. Yeah, it's really interesting, the whole thing about speed. Um, so as I think as a society, everything just happens so much quicker. We find ourselves rushing. Um, and so when you do get that moment to stop, whether that's a, the moment that you take or whether it's kind of forced on you, um, you know, that's when we can often recalibrate to go, do I need to be going this fast? And am I even going the direction that I want to be going? Or is it because everybody else was running in that direction? And, and again, if we take it back to instinctive fear responses, and sometimes I call it high functioning fear, because it's not that everyone is in a, in a blind panic running around everywhere. Like these are people doing very important things and earning high salaries and you know, all of that kind of stuff and, and performing well. Um, but what they're doing is effectively the same as you know, just following the crowd. Um, and it's, it's the same mechanism that's at play. So it's that kind of thing. If you're in a busy street and all of a sudden everyone or feels like everyone around you is just running in that direction, what do you do? You might look and go, what are they running from? But probably if you get caught up in the panic, you're just going to, I'm going to run too. (laughs) 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 Because there's something in us innately, and that's probably part of our survival instinct, I reckon, because, um, yeah, that's what one of the reasons why humans have, if you know, taken over the world essentially, um, because we are able to learn from each other. You know, it's not just that I've seen danger and I'm running away, it's I can tell from the way you're running, you've seen danger, and so therefore I don't need to go see the danger for myself, I'm going to run along with you. And so we take our cues from each other. Um, and I think, yeah, that, again, that's a really natural thing for us to take our cues from each other. Now, if you think about it in the modern workplace and modern life. What cues are we taking from each other? And what cues are we, what signals are we sending to each other? Um, and how, how accurate are they? And you know, it, you know, what if one person's anxiety has actually just rippled out into everything else? You know, what, if, what if that thing that they thought was danger was actually just something unfamiliar? Um, you know, and, and so you know, even just start stopping to ask, like, why are we running? What are we running from? What are we running towards? Why are we running? Yes, those kind of questions, it's really useful to ask ourselves from time to time. So whenever you, you find that, that break in the, the sort of the pattern, if you like, use it as an opportunity to go, what are we doing? Like, you know, I feel like I've been running. I feel like I've been going 100 miles an hour. What have I been running from? What am I running towards? Um, anything I want to change about that? And and you're, the second part of your question, you know, how do we do all of that kind of work without feeling negative about ourselves? Again, I think that comes back to that, early, the, you know, that earlier question of, is this an open door or a shut door? You know, is this like, oh my goodness, what an absolute idiot I am to have been running so hard for so long and now things chasing me. You know, do I use that as like, <laughs> you know, a shut door? Like, or do we use it as an open door? Like, oh, I've just noticed there's nothing chasing me. I've noticed that I'm in control of how fast I run and where I run to and whether I run at all. You know, I have control of my legs. I can choose to sit. And, you know, and, and therefore it's, a, it's an open door. So I think 
you know, seeing struggle not as a, a judgment on yourself, but seeing as an opportunity to decide and, and make that decision. So an opportunity to pay attention, what, what's going on, ask those questions, an opportunity to, to define your own version of success and what, what's good. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think you know, it's often um, one of the, actually one of the um, mantras I learned in very early days of parenting was um, to be a good enough mum most of the time with intermittent lapses into hopelessness and brilliance. And that was like my mantra for anti-perfection. So you know, you, it's not about perfect. It's about like good enough. And sometimes you get the hopeless, sometimes you get the brilliance. It's like there's a whole spectrum. Um, and again, you know, that's how we can look at, at struggle of going, what is this teaching me and what do I want to use it for? And how am I growing? What am I learning? What do I know now that I didn't know yesterday? What am I clearer about now that I wasn't as clear about yesterday? And, and take that gift. Don't use it to beat yourself up. Just use it to inform yourself going forwards. I think the work you are doing is might just be like a giant step towards having wonderful mental health. I think the chaos that is created where we are, we want to be productive, especially, you know, this younger generation, because they're coming out of colleges, they're going to the job market, they want to have success and make money. And, you know, because they're also Instagram influenced. So they want all that. But they also really want to take care of themselves, take care of the people around them, which is such a beautiful thing to do. But they're not able to do that. Because again, it's like this struggle is not supposed to exist. And that is what leads to a lot of the chaos. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I say, you know, Maybe struggle isn't like an interruption of work or life. So it's not life interrupted. It's not work interrupted. Maybe this is life. This is work. Yeah, this moment of struggle, there's some good work to be done here. So rather than feel like frustrated that it's getting in the way of the work, maybe it's like, ah, okay, the reason why I'm struggling with wanting that good work-life balance and, and well-being and wanting meaningful work, that's not a bad struggle. Yeah, it's not an easy answer. But it's a good struggle. It's a good thing to wrestle with. And that's you know, something that, that the younger generations have got a better handle on is this importance of well-being. And that's brilliant. Um, and so it's, you know, okay, do I, I think, you know, older generations kind of had this whole, a, a big story of sacrificing well-being for success. And, you know, the younger generations might be going, actually, I want the well-being. So do I have to sacrifice the success? But maybe it's not. Maybe it's like, how do we wrangle and wrestle with this thing to go, what does it look like to have both? And yes, there will be some working out. It won't be perfect. There will be compromises. There will be sacrifices. But you decide what trade-off is, is meaningful and worthwhile for you. Beautiful. Talk to me about your beliefs around productivity. So when people think of productivity, often they're thinking of how do I get things done? How do I do things faster? Or I've got too much to do, not enough time. How do I fit it all in? So we, often the start of a productivity conversation is revolved around quantity. It's like, yeah, but I've got a problem. I've not got enough time. I've got too much to do. How do I cram it in? Um, the problem with that is that it, we end up pursuing, when we end up pursuing quantity just for quantity's sake, we can end up working ourselves really, really busy and not necessarily getting anywhere. We can end up, like we say, sacrificing your well-being. We can end up burning out. But also we can end up getting really good at doing stuff that actually doesn't bring us anything. It's, you know, it's unrewarding. So productivity is, is not the goal. Um, productivity is, is a tool. And so if you pursue the tool as a goal, you get a, if you open up a toolbox and you get a hammer, you get a hammer. You know, <laughs> that's all it is. It's just a tool. What you do with that hammer it's what's important and, and what's meaningful. So that's why the, the very first chapter in, in this book here, How to Be Really Productive, is why productivity isn't just about getting stuff done. And instead, I talk about three things. I talk about meaning, purpose, and joy. Um, because without those things, all we're doing is being busy. Um, so meaning, purpose, and joy, what is meaningful to you? What, um, you know, the purpose is like, what, what is it for? You know, what, what, are you, what are you using that hammer for? Um, is it about putting a nail in the wall? Is it about fixing a leak in a pipe? I don't know. Um, you know what's the purpose, but what's the meaning as well? Why is, it, why is it important to you? So it comes back to what I was talking about earlier, defining that success on your own terms. And then, and then the joy, like what brings you joy? And sometimes it's the, the outcome of the work, 
but often it's the doing of the work as well. You know, I'm a big believer that as human beings, we were designed to have a good relationship with work. You know, that work isn't this evil necessity that we have to do. You know, we were designed to have a good relationship with work, to be doing something, to be purposeful, to create um, with our minds, with our imaginations, with our hands, and, and to, you know, to, have, to be able to influence and impact the world and to go, oh, here's the thing I made, or here's the thing I've done. I've made a difference. Um, and we get immense joy out of that. And also, we get joy from different things. So like you say, you love being alone. You, know, you love that solitude. That's part of how you've been built. Um, I love chatting to people. You know, I get energized by conversations. So that tells me something about what brings me joy. And so that's why I'm, I'm a big believer that you can have two people running exactly the same kind of businesses, but in a completely different way, because they're doing it in a way that serves them, that brings them joy. And the beauty is that when it brings them joy, they can put more into it because it's energizing work. Again, one of my friend, Marianne Countwell, says that your strengths are the things that strengthen you. It's not just about what you do well. It also strengthens you. It gives you energy. Um, and so, you know, for me, work productivity is about doing good work in a way that does you good as well as the good that you're doing out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It's, um, I've often heard like older people say, whenever we talk about, you have to do what you love, you have to do what you love, and then you don't work a day in your life. And my, I think it was someone in my family who said that, um, what does it matter if you love what you do or you don't? When I get that paycheck and I use that paycheck to pay for my child's education and I can see them growing into wonderful people or I pay for uh, this nice outfit for my wife, that brings me joy. So knowing that I put in nine hours of just absolute like work that I hate, but I took that upon myself and now I can do this, that joy washes away all the, the negativity, all the struggle, all the pain, all the suffering. And there's there's joy to that. And I'm like, okay, so that's one perspective that and that is one beautiful, beautiful perspective. Yeah. But again, you are you are so right. You have to have that clarity. I think that is something. Again, if you're moving too fast, <laughs> you're gonna miss that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you miss it. And and when you're moving too fast, you then you then make knee jerk decisions. You know, then so often, you know, like somebody moving too fast, if someone say for example, someone's stuck in a job they hate. And that you know, and and in that story of like, I get joy from spending the money, but then they get stuck in a situation of like, I can't leave the job because I don't have enough money to leave the job because I'm spending it all. Yeah, then it becomes a well, actually, the things that you're spending it on, is it worth the cost of you know, the, 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 the however many hours you're spending in a miserable job, you know, job, and and is it still worth that cost? Because it could be that it was worth the cost before, but it's not anymore. So maybe it started off being about putting the children through school. But actually now the kids are at school and I'm just paying for, you know, holidays and, you know, things to, things to escape, from, you know, from my life into and things like that. And it's like, do I actually really, really like, it? do I get a lot of joy from this car that I've just bought? Or actually, would I get more joy from spending my time doing a different kind of work? And maybe I can't afford that car, but Boy, I'd really enjoy doing that work. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I think you're right. It's easy to tell the, the black and white stories. It's easy to tell the either, you know, it doesn't matter as long as you know, you, you're, you're paying for your family and pay for what matters or you know, do what you love and you, know, no, yeah, you never work a day in your life, which is only half true because there's always, there's always the boring, the irritating as well. Yeah. And so you know, it's easy to tell those black and white stories, but reality is somewhere in the middle. It's, you know, it, it's somewhere in the middle. And it's, again, it's up to us to figure out how much of this one, how much of that one, how does it fit together? You know, is it too far this way, too far that way? Um, and it's a moving picture as well. So it's evolving. So you might have made a decision once, but revisit that decision every now and again. How does it sit with you? Because you, you'll change as a person as well. Like, you know, your, your, your values might change, your needs might change. So as you learn more about yourself, you might decide, okay, that served me before, but now, actually, I want to make a different decision. So much nuance there. I have to ask you, what do you do to keep figuring things out in your life, to keep like, cutting through the noise 
for you what it means to enhance your productivity and are there like any go-to methods that you use? Yeah, so from a practical basis, I so I know that if I keep things, if I try and remember and hold on to things in my head, um, my head gets becomes a very, very busy place. Um, so, you know, so some practical things are, you know, get things out of my head. Um, so any to-do list do not live in my head. They've got to live somewhere else that I can kind of go through. I can dump things there. I can review it and make decisions about what I need to work on. Don't rely on my own memory. But also it means that I can look at everything and make some decisions around like, that's too much. You know, what do I need to park? What do I need to say no to? That thing there, I told myself was really important, but I haven't looked at it for three months. What does that mean? What do I want to do about that? So having all of that sit outside of my head allows me to review my workload and make good decisions around it. So that that's definitely a you know something that I've honed over the years is is what I teach when I you know, run productivity ninja courses and things like that. And the beauty of running the course is that you have to walk your talk. So I often show my own second brain as a demo to go like, here's how I do it. Um, and so you know, that keeps me honest as well. You know, I'm walking the talk and, and sharing what I do. But another practice, so you talked about like taking that time out to, to journal and to write things down. That's something I try and do on, you know, sort of on a regular basis. It's not as regular as some other people might do it. So, you know, some people are very regimented. I've learned one thing about myself is I'm not very regimented, but I can get consistency over time. Um, so really interestingly, this past year or so, I've been on, on a health journey um, and, you know, I've been working with this, this health coach, a friend of mine, and there's an app that we use. And each day there are certain things to tick off, like, have I done that? Have I not? And, you know, I don't, Managed to tick things off every day. And yet, at the end of the first year of working together, he was like, Do you realize you've had 90% ticks? You, you've, you're like, you've, you've done what you said you wanted to do. 90%, that's blooming good. Yeah, that's really good. And I realized that I might not have consistency in the way that I can do things every day. And there are some people who do. Like a friend of mine decided, I think when she was 49 turning 50, that she was going to run every single day of that year and call it the golden year. She's carried on running for about three years after that, every single day. And she's really good at, she calls it streaking. Yeah, really good at going, I'm going to do a small thing every day and I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm not actually that good at that. What I tend to do is go, here's something I'd like to do more often than not. And every time I do do it, I'll count it as progress. When I don't do it, I don't beat myself up about it. And, you know, and I tr just try and like, so the aim is just do it as often as I can and then let those results add up. And that got to 90%. Um, so, so again, a lesson in knowing yourself and adapting to your personality. But so one of the things that I do on a, a sort of regular practice, but not always at the same time is, is, you know, doing like a weekly review. So a time when I sort of review my workload and make decisions about that. But I also do a bit of journaling. And usually it's just like, what are my tadars? What's something, you know, what, what are some good things that happened this week? My wins and that sort of thing. What are my ahas? What have I learned or noticed? Um, sometimes I might go, well, what are, what are my standout moments? So it might not be an achievement, but it might be something that particularly stood out to me, um, you know, in, in my week. And then what are my wrangles? So again, walking my talk, I talk about struggle. Let's pay attention to what I've been, I've been struggling with, what I've been wrangling with. Um, and I just use that as a practice to notice. And so it's, it's kind of no judgment. It's not about achieving anything. It's just about noticing. And then you can notice if there are patterns. Um, you can notice if it's like, oh, it's the same thing all the time. You can kind of go back and go, oh, yeah, that's the lesson that keeps coming back to me. That's interesting. <laughs> Um, and yeah, you know, and I find that really helpful as a good way of like zooming out rather than being sort of really focused on like that's the thing I need to sort out right now. Tell me about what resource people can use to make this process somewhat easier for themselves. So, um, one of uh, the strands of my work. So there, there are there are three strands to my work. So I do I, I, I speak. Um, so I speak at you know, on stages at conferences that sort of thing. Um, I coach, so that's one-to-one -one work, and I run workshops. 
So that's typically a small group of people where we get really practical. And the workshops are based on the work of Graham Olcott, who wrote the book How to Be a Productivity Ninja. He's a good friend of mine. We basically started working together over 10 years ago. So I sort of joined the team at Think Productive to be one of, our, one of their productivity ninjas, and I run the workshops uh, along with you know, quite, quite a few others. So if you want to know about that, the book, How to Be a Productivity Ninja, will talk you through everything that we go through in the workshops. Or if you go to thinkproductive.com, you'll see you know, that there are, there are some free resources on there and there are some workshops you can sort of public workshops that you can sign up for a ticket to. Or if, you know, if there are a group of you, if you work in a, you know, a business or an organization where there's, there's a team of you that wants to do it, just get in touch and we can talk about how we might bring, you know, bring that course to you. But yeah, I know that we discourses earlier. This is I, what I like to say, see this as it's not a blueprint of like, follow me and do what I've done. It's more a framework. So you know, it's like, here are the pieces that you need to think about. You know, so here's the principles, here's the why to, you know, and then here are some ideas about how to. And then in our, particularly in our full day workshop, we dedicate a good chunk of time in the afternoon to actually doing it. So that's where people start to build their own, we, we call it a second brain system, but like start to build their own system. And then that's where I can do some one-to-one -one coaching with each person to help them to you know, to kind of adapt it and refine it for themselves. Um, so they've got that space to create something and then to come away. So it's, it's very much, it's, it's more of a, a course that gives you the space to reflect and to pause and do some of that thinking and then to design and implement something that's yours rather than to copy somebody else's. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Till then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.